I'm leading a, a, a little presentation here on our panel on schools. And, and you know, I just want you to know as uh, having worked in urban forestry and then being on the grant, working for Cal Friendly and doing grants, school, a lot of us are planting trees or trying to plant trees at schools. Schools have a lot of real estate, they're, they're property, they are in the middle of every community. So they're uh, you know, a, a great benefit when you have trees on them. And also it's our future. All those students, we want them to learn, we want them to know and live in an environment that's healthy now. And then also to get to have, to learn skills that will help them be um, good urban foresters and, and stewards of the land in the future. So it's, it's, there's like the, all these wins schools but then it's the opportunity and the challenge you know for some it's it is this great opportunity we get we you know open arms they want us to plan their schools and others are just continually hitting getting locked doors whenever and and not being able to be invited to the table so you know so it's a great topic and then second is when we did our network survey on what you want to talk about schools was overwhelmingly the top topic so we couldn't we couldn't like sweep that one under the rug anymore and say, oh God, everyone knows how to work with schools. We're like, no, we, we got to talk about schools. So it, it made great, it made perfect sense for us to do it to this panel. So um, for any of you who, who watched the uh, good news, um, some good news with um, John Krasinski at the beginning of the COVID uh, things, I'm going with the good news network. We're going to give you some good news of groups that have worked with schools. So I think anytime you have good news, it, it always plants seeds of hope. So if you, even if you're, if you're having a hard time, you'll have some, some ideas of different approaches. So I'm gonna have three different, completely different speakers um, talking. And there, it's, this panel is different than yesterday's in that each speaker is going to give us a, a short presentation back to back, I'll introduce each of them. And then we'll have questions and answers after. So we're starting off here with Mona. Mona's with Tree Fresno. Tree Fresno is, I think, really one of our founding network groups. And she came on board when um, we retired. And that was uh, just over a year ago. And um, and she just like leapt into leapt into action. And even and despite you know the, the pandemic coming on, was able to get some great partnerships in the Fresno area and you know I was like you know best friends with the mayor now no she went and got an award so she's got lots of stuff going on and and has had some great um luck with school so we're going to um she's going to share her presentation she's going to sheen scrub so I'm just going to turn it over to you um Mona all right okay can you hear me great um I I don't have screen sharing at this point Yes, um, we need, someone needs to, our host needs to make you a co-host. Okay, okay, wonderful. Well, I'll just go ahead and dive in as an interest of time and thank you for that introduction. And, and I loved hearing that the grant process is coming around from uh, John Melvin, because that's critical for our work. Uh, let's see, not yet. Um, I can't, okay, now you are, you're good. Okay, uh, it's so much more interesting with, with pictures, I think. So let's see here from the beginning. Okay, and I'm just showing some pictures because I think it's very helpful to um, sort of uh, paint a picture. So Tree Fresno has been around since 1985. Uh, we plant approximately 2,500 drought tolerant large canopy trees per year uh, in urban areas. Uh, we are going to reach 50,000 trees planted in Fresno, Madera, Kings and Tulare County uh, this year. So, uh, we're going to talk about schools and the work that we've done with schools since I've been in place since October 2019. Um, we look for people who love trees. So I find that um, that there, um, there are plenty of people out there that we can make the case for trees, but we often have people call the office or they're known entities from whom we've worked with before, or we identify them through outreach efforts. Um, so um, last year when COVID hit, uh, we had a concern about not being able to go out and visit schools, not being able to engage with people um, on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, before we figured out these virtual platforms, uh, we didn't know how we were going to reach our schools. So we created uh, an outreach um, program called uh, Make Your Schools Greener. We just called it a school districts campaign. And I was getting familiar since I was new uh, with all the school districts that we're associated with in Fresno, Madera, Kings, and Tulare counties. 
And so we basically reached out to all the contact people there um, and followed up. And our message was that there is no better time to be planting trees. Uh, we asked them what their needs were. Um, if not now, perhaps like when could we, um, if we weren't going to plant last spring, we could talk about the fall. Uh, we used, um, we urged our school partners to look at, at uh, Tree Fresno as a resource and to take this opportunity during COVID uh, when there weren't people on campuses to actually uh, start thinking about uh, and putting in uh, more trees in place. So we encourage schools to think about planting uh, as improvements while staff and students were away, we reminded them of the benefits, obviously uh, improved air quality, that's a big topic here in this region, reduced heat and increased shade. This is obviously EnviroScreen, a tool we routinely use as part of Cal Fire Urban and Community Forestry Grant. We specified to schools that we have resources to plant uh, large canopy trees, uh, which are uh, derived not only from Cal Fire, but we also had a high-speed rail grant where we ended up planting over 3,000 trees. And then the California Air Resources Board, we have a very unique project uh, called a Special Environmental Project, which is focused um, on the construction of vegetative barriers, um, including the measurement of air quality. It's an effort to reduce uh, pollution flow from busy roadways into nearby neighborhoods. And obviously that includes schools. So this year we'll have an add-on component with that uh, called um, Kids Making Sense. Uh, with our partners at Sonoma Technology, and they're going to teach students actually how to measure air quality and to interpret those results. So that should be fun this year. This is a barrier, one of four, which we built last year, uh, two on school campuses. I should note that we did not take a break uh, planting last year. Most of our activities are outdoors uh, and we have a very small staff. So we were able to continue to move forward. Um, and then uh, I wanted to mention a strategy which I used with council districts. It sort of popped up uh, within the city of Fresno. Uh, this came up when we were notified by a new energetic council member who asked us to support his planting pledge to plant 100 trees in his first 100 days. So Tree Fresno um, created a map for him to have a quick reference to areas of his district that would qualify for free trees. Obviously tree um, schools and parks are uh, priority areas uh, for council people. Um, I ended up doing this for the remaining districts as well, hoping for more enthusiastic uh, council members to work with us on planting trees um, in schools and parks. Um, and then um, also that beautify, that concept of beautifying neighborhoods is really uh, current right now. We have a Beautify Fresno effort out of the city of Fresno that's been a great partnership for us. In this photo, you see actually a picture under those balloons of tree poets from Robinson School who were recognized at, at council member Tyler Maxwell's event. And what a great way to celebrate trees. And teachers, the staff, and family came out to support that effort and helped us plant trees in at both the school and the park. And we talked about uh, champions for trees. Uh, this is a gentleman who contacted us here at Tree Fresno, and we responded. So he is the vice principal of Hoover High School. So last weekend, this is from a photo from last weekend, we worked with this person who loves trees. And um, he called, I followed up with maintenance and operations of the school district. And this is, some, this is something that I try to do is be a resource to these um, active uh, staff members at the schools when they say they like um, trees on campus. We know at Tree Fresno that we really shouldn't be planting without um, the blessing of, of operations and maintenance. So we go through some of that hard work for them and help to support their efforts. Uh, we actually brought out um, the environmental, Central California Environmental Justice Network, who brought families to help us plant trees on that campus. I want to mention that uh, we also work with community colleges uh, as they're growing campuses at an extraordinary rate in California. This is a planting at Porterville College um, in Tulare uh, just a month ago. Um, the first camp, this was the first campus event that they had since COVID. Uh, you, you see actually the president of the school there, Cla Claudia Habib, in her red mask there. Um, they were so excited. It was a very touching event. 
They wrote an article in their newsletter focused on the significance of the trees, um, the history of the trees on campus, and their ability to filter pollutants out of the air. Uh, Fresno State is also uh, another great partner for us. We planted over 300 trees with them over the past few years under the High Speed Rail Grant. And partners like community colleges and Fresno State uh, and Fresno Pacific, too, are very willing to plan for the future with us. And I find that that is actually critical, is when we finish one project that we should start um, talking about what are we going to do next on the campus, because they, again, have the real estate to plant. This is a Google map of our next Cal Fire project together, planting a row of 300 trees on the edge of uh, the Fresno State Farm. So that should be really exciting, and I'm hoping that that uh, that that sort of uh, proves an example for even the farming community about how you can incorporate large canopy trees um, on farms. And then finally, I wanted to mention that we're currently building an online database uh, to, to provide as a resource, a teaching resource for educators as part of our next CAL FIRE grant due in 2023. It'll connect um, to California's education standards so that they can serve to supplement the teaching experience and not to add to. So with that, I'll close up uh, this brief discussion, um, which engages uh, how Tree Fresno engages schools with their work. And thank you for the opportunity to present. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Mona. Um, we, again, we'll be doing questions when we have the three panelists up. So um, next up, we have um, Rosa Rivera Romoto. She comes to us from the San Fernando area. Um, Rosa uh, is a, she a professor at, at Cal State Northridge and, and she started a group, I think 20, 28 years ago called Padres Pioneros in, the, in her neighborhood in San Fernando. And she became um, active in urban forestry kind of by, in a way to improve their local school at San Fernando Elementary School. Um, they wanted to put trees in it and all of a sudden she you know needed funding and applied for a grant and she got a grant through us and it was a it's a very moving story both um chuck and i did side visits with um rosa and her her group um during their grant process it was um in the beginning phases in our social equity grant program and the the way the story folds out is is just a, a really beautiful story and i'm um excited um Rosa's going to come on here. Rosa, are you going to turn on your video? Let's see. I know she, oh, she's, you can unspotlight me and we'll look at, at um, Rosa's presentation. Oops. <laughs> okay, now I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was muted and <laughs> turned off. <laughs> Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you for introducing me. Uh, I am uh, Rosa Rivera Furumoto. I'm a professor in the Chicano Studies Department at uh, California State University, Northridge, and I'm also uh, part of Padres Pioneros, Parent Pioneers. So uh, let's see, I'll go ahead and, and share a bit. Uh, so the, the story that I'm going to share with you uh, is um, is about a, a, a school, a school in the city of San Fernando, and the name of the school is San Fernando Elementary School. And uh, I just wanted to talk about the vision that um, uh, that school community had, uh, which was to create an urban forest in their school. Uh, so this school is very interesting because it's a very old school. It's one of the oldest in the Los Angeles Unified School District, over 100 years old. And, um, and it's also part of the city of San Fernando, which is a small city right in the middle of the big city of Los Angeles. There's, so there's only about 25,000 folks that live there. It's a predominantly low income uh, immigrant uh, Latino community. And, um, and so having shared that, this is an image of one of our first planting days where we all came together and formed a circle uh, just to kind of, you know, welcome each other and to have a good day as we started uh, with that project. Uh, but this school also has a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, so I'm sure all of you are real familiar with them, but this is a, a, a photo of uh, the primary schoolyard that 
is just so barren. There were no trees on this uh, schoolyard. And uh, obviously when the teachers and the kids were out there, you had all the heat, you had all the heat islands, right? And uh, it was just a horrible environment for kids. There was nowhere for them to go when they were um, hot and, and all of that. Uh, but the cool thing then about this school was that they did have a beautification committee. Um, oh, and let me just uh, share one other thing that I think is really important. So um, this school is also located in a, in a community that has a very high pollution burden index and uh, high rates of asthma as a result. Uh, but you can see where they are, they're in the 90 plus, um, you know, rating for a pollution burden index, which is extremely high. So that means that this school really could, you know, needed the support. Um, yeah, and so, um, so in, in comes Fathers Pioneros, Parent Pioneers, and uh, this is just an image uh, of a meeting. We would always just meet in my home. We don't even have our own office space, so we just meet in the community wherever we can. And this is many of those um, mothers, and you also see some of the students from CSUN and some of my colleagues from CSUN as well. So uh, I'm sharing this photo to say a little bit about Fathers Pioneros. They're uh, a group of environmental activists who are all also mothers and grandmothers, Latina immigrant mothers and grandmothers, who are just really driven by the idea that we need to do something uh, to take care of the planet for our children, right? And our grandchildren and the generations to come. So that's their motivating factor. And so, um, and we heard that the school was interested in uh, greening their school we stepped forward and said, oh, well, maybe we can help. You know, how can we be a service? Because we've been working in that school for many years, doing educational programming, working, doing teacher training, and just doing all sorts of things with the school. So we had a long history with the school already. And uh, they welcomed our support. And so from there, um, that's kind of how we got started in uh, doing this project. Uh, we did happen to see or heard of the California Relief and we, uh, I did write the proposal, uh, but I want to say just how uh, innocent I was not knowing much about anything. Uh, but anyway, uh, I did want to say a few things that, you know, in low income communities, I think these are the communities that really, as you can see with a high pollution burden index, need the help of, of, of greening their school. And yet often there's no one around to help them, right? So some of the challenges we face in these schools, um, are that they're almost all covered with asphalt, right? And uh, what that means though then is that when we want to do a school greening project there, we essentially have to cut open and do a bunch of concrete cuts. And um, so we, we partnered with Tree People who have a lot of expertise in this. And this is a shout out to Tree People because all along the way, they, they, they helped us, they showed us the way to go forward. They had many of the connections with the school district but we had that local connection with the school district, right? Uh, so together we were able to do things. So, um, uh, but our big challenge was we only had 25,000 to work with and these concrete cuts, there was about 42 of them, uh, they required $10,000. We ha hardly had any money left. And once you open up the ground in LAUSD, you have to pay for soil test. So the soil tests were $6,000. And at that point, I was just like, how are we gonna pay for any of this? How is this project gonna go forward? Uh, but we were fortunate that um, the local school board member, uh, one of my colleagues contacted them and they agreed to pay the full 6,000 for the soil test. So that allowed us to go forward with this project. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we, we came to, um, you know, the, the, the tree planting day, right? And days rather, because we had to do it over three days. Uh, but uh, what I loved about those days was um, having the families, the children, the community, this was obviously pre-COVID, uh, coming out and, um, you know, getting to just be involved with it. It was beautiful, beautiful days on, on the campus with the children and the volunteers and the families. And so um, I think though then the story that follows that though is this notion about you know, how do we really engage with communities? Because I'm, I'm a community activist from way back a long time. And, um, and always my sense is, well, how do you get communities involved in these things? 
And um, so I think that working with that school beautification committee with administrators, uh, the complex plant managers were actually really supportive with us. So Robert Lucas, he walked the school with me. And um, one of the interesting things about this project is we had initially asked for 25,000 to plant about maybe 40 something trees. And Chuck got back to us and said, no, you have to plant you know, close to 60. And so Robert Lucas, the CPM, he came out with me. He, he walked the grounds with me and he said, okay, here, 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 and here. And he just pointed out, he knew that he obviously knew where all the pipes were running. So he said, here's where you can plant trees. So originally the ones you see here were not in our original plan, but he helped us really just make it a much greener school. And what you're seeing now is part of a few photos. And this is actually from uh, more than a year and a half ago. I, I, I haven't had access to the schools because they've been closed since COVID in LUSD, they all shut down to uh, take updated photos. But um, what was interesting was how rapidly these trees grew. And I, I wanted, what I wanted to say about this though was um, when a whole school community gets involved, there was just from the children though. So the children, when I would be on campus, I would see them walking around with their little buckets of water, going to plant the tree that their classroom had adopted, right? And, and the children just really loved these trees and the teachers were then using them as part of their education, the educational content. And so, um, you know, all the barriers that we had encountered at this school, you know, they, I mean, some of them continued during the summer. Uh, we had to figure out how do we get these trees watered, you know, when, uh, you know, the, the usual folks that might be watering them were not available. So uh, Padres Pioneros stepped in and we were going into the schools during the summer to help water them and to keep these trees growing, uh, going, right? Uh, but fortunately we had a great survival rate there. And uh, so we were able to continue with that, right? And um, uh, let me just go one more here. And so I did wanna say something about our educational program. So along with the tree planting, then we had a very solid uh, educational component. So we do an after school programming with the children and I involve students from CSUN that are future teachers and they help uh, implement an environmental uh, STEAM project at the school once a week and it's with the kids and the families. So we're able to connect some of the enrichment going on at the school with the actual tree planting, right? And, uh, 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 and so you see some of the things that the kids and families were doing. Uh, after when COVID hit, we actually went to a Zoom platform to do this. So we've been doing this virtually with the families. Uh, but the final thing that I was gonna share was that the, this, <laughs> this little tiny project had a huge ripple effect because from here, we had a lot of students getting involved, CSUN students, but families getting involved in doing local cleanups in doing tree planting and tree people uh, themselves have now, they've planted, I think, I don't know, over a thousand trees in the city of San Fernando. But uh, what you're seeing here are CSUN students involved and then you're seeing the families from the local schools involved in the cleanups. And we're also, uh, we've created, we're working with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and we have a restoration site in Angeles National Forest. This is a sister site to this school so the kids are studying chaparral environment, and then they're also connecting that to the urban forest in their school. So um, what our next steps are, we, we have another grant and we're gonna be working at another school. And we're, we're super excited about that. And I just wanted to thank you for listening, thanks. Thank you, thank you, um, Rosa. So for our um, third speaker today, um, we have Ryan Berryman, and Ryan comes to us from um, the San Bernardino area. And I was, you know, talking in one of my breakouts yesterday. But one of the really great things about um, some of our newer grant programs, when we do these, some of these smaller grants um, that we've been doing through Arbor Day, is the chance to partner with groups that we never would have known about before and they didn't know about us. So it really opens up this, this, this valuable opportunity. And one of these groups has been the San, um, San Bernardino Fatherhood. They're on their second um, Arbor, 
Arbor Week grant this year, and their focus has been on the schools in um, the San Bernardino area. So Ryan's gonna gonna share um, a little bit about this. He's a retired social worker, and um, you're doing low tech, right? Aren't you, Ryan? Yes. <laughs> Yes, low I have those pictures step. ready, so you let me know when you want okay, me to share. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. This is really all new to me. This this whole tree planting thing is all new to me. I've done gardening um, on my own and really enjoyed it, um, but this is really new to me. Um, my first contact with Cal uh, California Relief was last year, where I received my first grant. I planted five trees, but my initial interest, my main interest going into this was fathers. You know, again, I come from a, a background of social work, working in children, family services. And when I retired, I wanted to just get fathers more involved and responsible and committed in children's lives. So this kind of was introduced to me uh, due to the fact that I volunteer in schools. And one of the things I do in schools, I go into the schools and I read to children. Along with reading to children, I established dad's clubs in certain schools. One particular school that I established a dad's club over the last couple of years was a school that my grandchildren attend, and that's Wilson Elementary School in San Bernardino. I'll talk to you a little bit more about San Bernardino uh, a little bit later. But so what I did is I went into the school and I had a relationship with the principal and then obtaining this grant, I asked him, if it's a possibility that we can have trees planted on the school. And he said, yeah, Ryan, that's a great idea. So this is my first time doing this. And I did go over a few challenges. There were some challenges. So in my dad's club, what I did is I met with a group of parents at dad's club. And that was in February of 2020. And so I talked to them about, you know, and, and I was going to call it plant a tree with dads. Because we know moms that show up. Moms always shows up at school events, though the idea was to encourage dads to show up as well. So it wasn't just exclusively for dads, but encouraging dads to show up, knowing that moms to show up and kids to show up as well. So we started the first meeting in February, but then in March, uh, the pandemic hit. And so I had initiated all the paperwork and uh, submitted it to the principal. And then the principal, he wasn't sure how to go about doing it. So I said, well, let me contact Grounds and Maintenance. So I contacted the supervisor with Grounds and Maintenance through the San Bernardino City Unified School District, which is a school district that I, I live in and my grandchildren attend. And so he was really unsure. A lot of times I didn't get a call back. Um, and so I just was persistent and eventually contacted him. And then some other people contacted me also. Uh, which was the supervisor for um, community relations and communications. And she said, well, Ryan, we it has to go through the school, dist uh, school board to get approved for you to uh, purchase these trees for the school. So I had to wait, you know, to get it approved through the school, uh, school, dist school board uh, because they only meet certain times. And then also meeting with a nursery, being able to pro provide proper trees and making sure those trees were approved through the grounds and maintenance. So there was a number of different things that I had to do to make sure everything went smoothly, number of people I had to contact. Um, you can go ahead and show the trees. Uh, well, the initial area, you can show both photos, it'd be fine. The initial area where I looked at thinking where the trees could possibly be put it was right here in this area right here. Again, this is before the schools closed uh, in 2020. And I was thinking like five large shade trees right, going right down the, uh, that grass area. And this is in front of a, a neighborhood as well. And then far back, you can see a large, I think it's a pine tree uh, going straight up. And that's pretty much, and, and when parents come to pick up their kids, there's no shaded areas for them to stand. And also looking at the other side of the street where the neighbors are, there's a lot of uh, trees on the other side where the neighbors live. So I was just thinking this would be a great area, as well as that parking area right there is a bus stop as well. And so eventually I was able to plant trees and you can show the next with where the trees are planted. Okay, you can see these trees. This is where the trees and this is, uh, I believe, yeah, this was in December. We wasn't able to get the trees in until December because schools were closed. 
waiting until the cooler weather trees. I was able to get the, the school board approved it in November and I had the trees transported to the grounds and maintenance of the school district for them to plant. Um, I was told that I could not plant the trees because of liability. These were uh, 24 inch um, Indian laurel trees that were planted. So grounds and maintenance, they planted the trees. And one of the problems is, is that the trees sat in grounds and maintenance for about a month before they were planted, which was really disturbing. So that was a challenge uh, where it really wasn't, um, it really wasn't coordinated so that the trees could get planted a lot quicker. So that was a learning experience for me. If you, if you see down the, some of the trees, a couple of the trees went into shock because of that. They wasn't cared for while they were in grounds and maintenance. And I was a little disturbed about that. So that's pretty much, and this was at Wilson Elementary School in San Bernardino. A little information about San Bernardino that I pulled up. Thank you. A little information about San Bernardino. San Bernardino is surrounded by the Little Mountains, San Bernardino Mountains and San Gregorio Mountains. We also have the San Bernardino International Airport where there's a lot of warehouses. Um, Amazon, as well as a whole bunch of other warehouses are surrounded by, are inside the city of San Bernardino. We also have the Santa Fe Railroad, which runs through the city of San Bernardino, as well as the 10 freeway and the 210 freeway and the 215 freeway. So San Bernardino pretty much sits in a basin. I remember in the summertime, as you can see the, a layer of small just kind of sit in the middle of San Bernardino, which really makes it unhealthy air-wise as far as air quality. And so when I presented this, um, to the school board, uh, and as well as to the um, principal, I stress the importance of, you know, providing beautification for our area, improvement of air quality, wildlife, presented all of that. I also show pictures of the trees after they were planted on my social media page through San Real Fatherhood, and a lot, I got a lot of positive responses, as well as responses from other principals and other schools making comments like, oh, I wish I could have trees like that planted at my schools. So this year I've had one tree plant, uh, one school that we were able to plant five trees at Hillside Elementary School. And I don't have pictures of that, but that worked out really well as far as the coordination, getting trees planted, getting school board to approve it and all of that. And then I've had two other schools that were looking at planting trees um, and that would be Emerton Elementary School as well as Arrowhead Elementary School in the city of San Bernardino. And possibly, I'm, my goal is to have four more uh, schools where we can have trees planted this year. So that's kind of like where my goal. Um, some of the contacts that I've made with regards to um, this tree planting event, I made contact with uh, Community Action, uh, Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. Uh, making contact with them, seeking their support and approval with the uh, goal of planting more trees in the city of San Bernardino uh, School District. Um, so I made contact with them as well as parents. I've contacted certain parents. I do other things. I go to barbershops, you know, I have like little libraries and barbershops. So I've talked to parents in barbershops as well as parents that I do educational parenting classes with. And I ask them, I said, do you have children that go to the elementary school? And they say, sure. I said, what do you think about planting trees at their school? And they say, sure, I think that'd be a great idea. And I explained to them all the benefits of it and everything. So what I encourage parents to do is to contact their principal and let their principal know that I would be willing to donate trees at their school. And so that's been, uh, successful with me as well. I've had two schools where I was able to do that with uh, parents. And the ideal is, is that um, I talk to these parents and if they have children in elementary school who are like in second and third grade, I tell them that all I need them to do is get the support of other parents who attend that school and to watch out for those trees that are growing in their schools, make sure they're well established, uh, have water and they're, not, uh, they're gonna be able to survive. And that's the only thing I require of these parents. You know, so for them to say that this is something that we've done together, not just San Bernardino Fatherhood, but those trees belongs to those parents as well as our community. So I encourage that upon them. Um, and I've been successful with that as well. One of the things I've also done is reached out to one of the board members, 
with the uh, city of San Bernardino Unified School District. And I approached her about the idea of the city of San Bernardino Unified School District looking at some kind of strategy or some kind of uh, initiative to plant more trees in our school, especially our older schools, which are, are, are um, lacking with a lot of, of trees. I've heard stories of parents who um, uh, attend some of these schools where grounds and maintenance have cut down trees that have been there for like 50 or 60 years. And they've always used the, the reason because the trees were dying, they were termited, uh, had termites in them or whatever. The parents are being very upset because of that, because it provided shade, comfortable air for them to stand in, as well as in, uh, wildlife and uh, improvement of air quality. So, um, also other kind. Of, so one of the things, um, going back when I talked to the board member uh, for the school district, what she suggested to me is to wait until June about presenting this to the school board and possibly pre and presenting it to the superintendent. Uh, because right now we have a new superintendent who will be starting in the month of June. So that's my uh, objective is to present it to the school district to see if they can look at some kind of initiative where they can uh, plant more trees at our school for the benefit of our, for all the positive benefits that um, you, you're aware, aware of and, of and that I've already indicated. And so that's kind of like where I'm going with this now. That's kind of like my agenda. All right. Uh, that's that's great. Hey, thanks, Brian. And I think they're, they're, um, I would like to pull the three panelists together. So if um, we can get you to turn your videos on, we can spotlight the three of you together. Um, and I think, um, there we go. There's Rosa. And then we'll get it. All right, really, really great. Now you can see that the three different approaches here to um, to working with schools and and at three different levels. So you know, Mona who had who is working in a more established as an urban forest, and then a partnership here with um, with parent pioneers and tree people, and then Ryan starting this out and just really doing it from the ground. So I wondered if there were questions um, that people had. I know there's a lot of kudos here for all of you. I, if you can see the, the wonderful comments that people are making to you, um, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, I did want to say, I did have one question. Um, and I know, I think it's, 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 it's inspired from, from Rosa's with the, with the asphalt, being able to do the asphalt cuts. And I think that's, you know, most schools are so resistant to that. And I know you did have a, a price tag that was pretty high on that. And so I was just wondering how you ended up getting that, that, that covered and then how you moving forward, how you just, now that that's something you know could happen, if that just has made it you more like thinking about those when you're in a school now, like, oh, a tree could go here, even though it's got, you know, it's, it's an impervial surface right now, impervious. Yeah, thanks for the question, Amelia. And, and yes, um, now when we look at schools or when you know we walk the school grounds, I, I don't automatically assume no trees can't go here because of the asphalt. Instead, we're like, wow, wouldn't this be great for a shade tree for the kids when they're out there playing? And so yes, that, that did really shift uh, my thinking. Uh, however, think about it. It was the CPM, the complex plan manager that got my brain going that way. He was just, yeah, you can put a tree there. So, <laughs> so I think that uh, sometimes we just need something to jog our minds about what we can do. And obviously with all the asphalt covering the trees, it's like we have to think differently because otherwise we're never gonna green these schools. Um, it's, it's kind of an over, you know, it's kind of very big, but I think you know, just looking at it and beginning to uh, imagine, I think it's the vision and then we can do things, yeah? Yeah. Um, Mona, there was a question. If you've had any success with, with, with putting trees in? Um, I haven't been involved in that yet. Uh, my tree tech just told me that we have actually widened areas to put trees in, but I am actually very impressed by Rosa's ability to like to plant trees, even though there's asphalt and concrete. I think that that's a great example about how the community wants to see trees. And it's a way that we can go back and sort of fix the way that we created the infrastructure in the first place, which was not the right way, not including trees. So thank you, Rosa, for being a great example for that. And I can't wait until we do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ron, do you think that too? When now you look at your schools, can you picture trees in some of the areas that are covered by asphalt now? 
You know, most definitely, you know, I've heard stories um, from some parents and school staff that trees were taken out where there was asphalt and then the area is covered back up with concrete. And so, you know, I think in San Bernardino, there's just a lack of knowledge, a lack of awareness, or even sensitivity with regards to importance of trees and, um, you know, planting more trees in our community. So I believe there's a lack of sensitivity and knowledge at this time, because things like that, otherwise things like that wouldn't have happened. It definitely contributes to the lack of green space in areas of the city that have lack of investment. It's like a lot, lack of consideration for that green space for the peoples that live there. And I look at it as, as part of this environmental justice issue is that we need to be able to go back and fix it. And yes, it may cost more, but we, we, you know, there, we have to do that. We have to do that to provide for our children and our communities. And here in Fresno, that, that concept of the heat island is very real and um, it's, it's very debilitating and, and people's lives are shorter because of it. So I, I, I commend all of you for the work. And I saw somebody on this chat that's removed 22,000 square feet of pavement in San Francisco since 2014. You know, kudos to you. And I, I think, you know, everybody here is inspiring us all to like pursue that just a little bit more. And knowing Marco, he probably did it with his shovel. You know, he's like, he's like superhuman. <laughs> um, let's see, there was a question here from Ken. What is the long-term process for keeping the trees irrigated? So that's one of, that would be for um, Rosa because you're working in those asphalt. That yeah, so uh, yeah, so actually though, we obviously did not have money to uh, install irrigation. So we completely rely on the teachers and the children to uh, water those trees, right? And maintenance of the school helps a little bit, but they actually don't have the time so it's the children and the and the um, and the teachers that have adopted their trees, and they just go out there and water them with their little buckets or whatever they have. Uh, and then, as I said, in the summer months, so we did have to step up. So Paradigm years went in and was watering. Once they're established, it's not so bad, right? Because these are all um, you know pretty drought tolerant. But their initial few years, they really need all that you know TLC to make it. Uh, but yeah, we di we didn't have the money to put in irrigation, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it is. I don't know. It was right next to the garden. A lot of those were next to where they have a little garden on your on the campus there, Rosa. I remember that that was it was the kids are super engaged in that part of the campus. It's just it's just beautiful. Um, there is a question here about the species palette that that you that you selected that you consider at schools, and I, I know you said mentioned drought tolerance, some other things that you that go through your mind when you select trees. Oh well, I have to just say though that uh, actually Cal Fire, uh, California really folks really helped us a lot because initially well, I didn't know anything about the trees. I'm not a biologist. And so uh, we just had a list of like a bunch of trees, like they were almost all the same. And then they, uh, uh, you know, Chuck got back to us and Amal Amelia helped as well. And they said, oh no, you need a variety of trees. And then they gave us recommendations. So uh, California Relief and tree people also helped to get a variety in so that we could, and that we're right for our area, you know, cause we're in obviously Southern California is extremely hot. So we needed trees that were gonna hold up. So they helped us, but I, I honestly didn't know. Uh, <laughs> so they were the greatest resource to us. Uh, I, I would like to say, I pretty much relied on grounds and maintenance and established a relationship with him. Like for example, before it was really di difficult for him to respond to my emails and phone calls. But after a while, um, I think once he got approval from a uh, higher up administration, he was a lot more open and also friendly. As a matter of fact, this last uh, school that we planted trees at, uh, they planted more trees in that school also. So I think it kind of like um, motivated grounds and maintenance as well as possibly even the school district to plant more trees. Uh, so I established a relationship with him with regards to water source and they were able to kind of like work with myself as well as the school staff uh, regards to where the trees be planted so they can make sure they get proper water source. Uh, where their irrigations were, and, and as well as the type of trees, because I don't want to purchase trees that the school district, because of liability or whatever reason, 
would not be willing to plant. So I really yeah. work a lot with the grounds and maintenance. And yeah, the, that's good. I think overall on a lot of these, they get, they get turned over to ground and maintenance for, for control. So I think at this point, what we're going to do is, is go into um, breakout groups so that we can share out a little bit about um, our own experiences working with schools, uh, much like we do when we're in, in person, so we can we can learn from each other. So I really appreciate um, the three of you for, for sharing with us, sharing your stories with us. And um, I know um, one of you has to slip out, but the rest of you, I hope you'll stick around and, and, and go into these. So our magic, our magic tech people are gonna put us into breakouts. And then we, we're gonna come back here and meet again.